Hello, and thank you for coming today. My name is Krista Capps, and I'm a faculty member in the Odom School of Ecology and the Savannah River Ecology Lab at the University of Georgia. And I'm making this recording as part of the Turtle Pond Talk series that's supported by the Georgia Museum of Natural History and the Friends of the Georgia Museum of Natural History. And though we can't be there today, I thought I would uh, show you a picture of my son out enjoying the turtle pond in front of the ecology building um, early in the shelter in place policies of the pandemic so we could all reflect and miss upon our beautiful turtle pond. Today I'm giving a um, talk and I realize I am blocking my name, but again, my name is Krista Caps, and I'm going to be giving a talk called Armored Catfish Are Awesome. And I'm gonna to try to highlight a few things through this talk. One, just kind of cover some aspects of uh, biodiversity. And I'm gonna be using uh, my favorite family of organisms, the Laura Koreids, um, as an example um, to highlight that diversity. And hopefully, I want to emphasize the importance of natural history collections, um, such as the kind that are maintained at the Georgia Museum of Natural History, and how important they are to document global biodiversity and also um, change in biodiversity. So there are many ways to think about biodiversity. Um, one way to think about it is documenting new species and just looking at giant assemblages of organisms and um, how we can unearth different types of diversity. So there's um, trophic diversity, so diversity in uh, things that organisms are eating. There can be species diversity, so thinking knowingly being able to see um, differentiation among species. And then there's genetic diversity within species. And so we're talking about um, just um, heterogeneity in the, the makeup of um, the genes of organisms. We can think about biodiversity from a perspective of thinking about the loss of biodiversity loss uh, due to environmental change and what um, implications that might have. And we can think about um, changing biodiversity by the additive effects of uh, non-native and invasive species that we're seeing globally. And so I kind of flippantly use the word awesome uh, because of armored catfish, because they are, but I, I wanted to just highlight um, the real reason I'm using this term. So the definition of awesome is arousing or inspiring awe that fills someone with um, reverential fear, wonder, or respect. And that's one of um, the ways to document it. And so the inspiring awe and thinking about armored catfish is to say that uh, there are about 6,000 known species of fishes in the neotropics. And so that's tropical regions um, in the Americas that extend up to Southern Mexico, which is where I do a lot of um, my work um, and down into um, the, the mid to lower sections of South America. And of those 6,000 fish species, over a thousand of them are actually armored catfish. And I'm just showing you some of uh, the diversity and the morphology that we see here. Uh, there's over a hundred and uh, 115 uh, genera, 1,006 species are what is currently um, updated in the catalog of fishes. And something awesome or awe-inspiring about this diversity is that if we think about um, when um, things were published, so this was a paper uh, published in 2019, there were only 983 species at that point in time. Um, and just to highlight this, they are the most diverse catfish family and the fifth the most species rich vertebrate family on earth. So they are just truly profound. But when you think about the rate of species that were being discovered of this family, we can go back even just a little bit more and we can see that even in 2012, there were only 830 species. Um, this uh, paper um, written by uh, Nathan Lujan um, 
Kirk Weinmiller and John Armbruster really was focused on the variation in how lorikids are diverse, which is mostly on their jaw morphology or how their mouth is built. Um, and it's really interesting because most of them feed on a generalized diet of detritus, which is the stuff that you find in the benthic or bottom habitats of streams and algae. And so it's, it's pretty amazing. But again, 2012, 830, now over a thousand. And so we can think about the rates of um, discovery or description of these species. Now, I, I want to just openly state that by discovery, I mean discovery to science. Um, any of you who have had experience fishing um, in different parts of the world knows that local people are not shocked by new species. They know what they are, they've involved them, and they've become integrated into their daily life. So these are species as they're known to science, not as they're known to humanity. And I just want to be very clear about that. But this is just from the same um, paper I showed you, this is what the mouth parts of Laura Curry's look like. Now, this is the perfect picture to say why many of you have actually probably seen a lorikid, and that is going to be part of our next discussion, um, that lorikids are very popular in the aquarium trade, uh, especially certain species within very um, a, a small number of uh, genera, and they are sold as uh, algae eaters in your aquarium. So it's not particularly um, shocking that their mouth parts look like this. You can see these um, the ridges that are used to scrape algae, but this is just a phenomenal picture of, of how some of this diversity manifests itself in lower Koreans. So going back to what I just said, this definition also um, has the term reverential fear in it. And you wouldn't think it, but armored catfish, um, because of their population or popularity in the aquarium trade, and I, I did a Google search again, and you can go find uh, a Plico. They are selling them at the PetSmart close to you um, in Athens for just about $7.50. Um, but they have, through the aquarium trade, extended their range from the neotropics again to almost global distribution where temperature doesn't limit their expansion. And it's directly because of their popularity in the aquarium trade that this has occurred. So it, it brings in a lot of interesting things to think about, um, about global economic pathways and development, um, how um, wealth ends up translating to different interactions with animals, aka having uh, a large aquarium in your home. Um, and then how that interacts with diversity and life histories of the organisms to understand whether or not they're going to end up being um, exotic and invasive species. But I want to go back to, and I said I was going to uh, try to highlight multiple aspects of diversity in this talk. And so I just wanted to talk to you about my passion for armored catfish and where it came from um, and how it led me to learn and love more about biodiversity itself and then focus on invasive species. And so when I started my dissertation work, I was at uh, Cornell University in the lab of Alex Flecker, and Alex had talked to folks who were uh, associated with this project, which is called the All Species, uh, the All Catfish Species Inventory. And this was funded as um, one of the four planetary biodiversity inventories that was funded by National Science Foundation in the early 2000s. And the goal was to um, extensively sample catfish populations in tropical regions of um, Asia, Africa, um, Indonesia, so the, the South Pacific, and then um, the neotropics to really try to understand um, what the diversity of catfish globally look like. Um, and this is uh, part of the team that I went with. And I, I just have to highlight that the, the people that were primarily responsible for this, um, two of the people that I am most familiar with were um, John Armbruster, um, who is at Auburn, um, and John Friel, who was at Cornell, who was the fish collections manager at Cornell, and now he's the, um, the head of the Natural History Museum at uh, Alabama. And so they were directing a lot of this, and one of their uh, one of John Armbruster's graduate students, Nathan Lujan, um, and my advisor, so Nathan and, and Alex are up here. Alex has the floppy hat with the sunglasses on, and Nathan is the tall person next to him. Um, they 
had a mild obsession with a weird group of farmer catfish that they wanted to find and they put pooled resources together to bring a, a, a bunch of different kinds of scientists um, from Peru and from the U.S. together um, to do this trip on the Marañón River um, in Peru and you can see that's highlighted in pink in the map and this was right after the first year of my PhD and I was so excited and obsessed and so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about that trip. Um, and I said they were obsessed with a weird group of fish uh, in the Marañón and those weird armored catfish actually eat wood and it is totally fascinating. I don't know if you knew that fishes ate wood. Um, if you do have a panaque, which is one of the um, the lower creeds that actually eat wood in your aquarium, you probably know they do, um, but it is a, a pretty widely distributed trait by this group of animals. And so we were on the quest to document new species here. And I, just to show you, um, this was one day of fishing in the Marañón and there are multiple species of wood eaters in this uh, pile of Laura Creeds. And um, these were all, they all ended up in the fish collection um, at the University of Alabama, or at Auburn University, pardon me. Sorry, I know that that will offend some people here, I apologize. Um, but these are wood eating fishes and there are multiple species of them. And it was so, it was such an amazing trip. And I just wanna highlight for students who might be um, watching this, that if you ever get the opportunity to do this, it was, you know, as a child, I daydreamed about leading uh, National Geographic trips and being on them. And that's what this was. It was totally incredible. And I'm just gonna show you some pictures of it. Um, so we went, um, from Lima up the coast over the Andes in two trucks. We were crammed together um, for just about two weeks. Um, and we were near the towns of Bagua and Santa Maria de Nieve, Nieva. And um, one of the, we sampled in the Marañón and in the tributaries. One of them was the Sanapa River, um, which um, we ended up being able to um, positively interact with um, some of the indigenous groups there. And it was just a fundamentally amazing and uh, incredible trip um, to meet the, the scientists and citizens of Peru and other people who are mildly obsessed with Laura Creeds. And one of the most interesting places we sampled was this, the, the Pongo de Mas Cerrite, sorry. And it's really narrow um, and it constrains the gorge. Unfortunately, it is um, one of the places that's been cited for a massive hydrologic project. And this picture doesn't do it justice, but you can see it right here where the river narrows. Um, I also, so it's right there where the red, the red lines are. Um, and this is what it looked like fishing in there. So the top part of just showing you that we would seine and do electrofishing and in rapids and in runs of the river. This is more in the open area and you can see that the banks are kind of normal. In the Pongo, um, it, it's just this sheer rock face and the water is just moving really, really quickly. And I just wanna show you what it's like to fish there. So I'm gonna leave this screen. Um, you're not gonna see me, I'm gonna share a different screen so you can see a video um, that was posted on Facebook um, of people in Peru fishing in the Pongo. So I'm going to try to find it here. I'll go here. And hopefully you can see it. I'm going to mute it because I don't think you can hear anything anyway, but um, So the water is just really moving um, in this area and you can see that the fish actually run upstream. So there are migratory species here. Um, I would assume there are species that migrate from the main stem into the tribs, especially um, during seasonal changes in flooding. Um, that's very common, but so much is still to be learned about these fish species. There are people working on it. Um, if any of you are interested, uh, Elizabeth Anderson, Beth Anderson, who's at Florida International University, she did her PhD at the University of Georgia. Uh, she's faculty down there, and I know she just submitted a grant to work with local communities that are um, fishing in the uh, in the Pongo and in the Marañón specifically. But you can see, as soon as he pulls out this cast net, you can see it's just full of uh, migrating fish species. It's so absolutely amazing. Okay, so now we're gonna go back. Um, and I'm gonna see if this will work. I apologize for the delay. Oops, sorry about that. 
Okay, and we're gonna have to go back to where we were. And I apologize, I don't know if I will continue to do this because I don't want to, but I'll do it one more time to show you something. Okay, so again, the diversity that we documented um, in the Marañón River, this is actually the um, upper Marañón and we were mostly in the middle, but you can just see the lower period diversity in this. On our trip, I think we um, documented for science between five and six new species. Um, and our trip was less than two weeks. So it was just absolutely incredible if you think about that. And this is kind of what I'm talking about, about this, this hidden diversity um, in these assemblages of organisms and just how amazing, um, frankly, evolution is, but, but just the diversity of species that you might not necessarily think about all the time. And it, I would not be, uh, my presentation would not be complete without this photo that was um, a, a fish that was alive. The fishermen who ended up finding it and then turning it into the collection in Lima stated that they actually shot the fish in, in the head to get it out of this wood jam it was in. On the other side of the fish, there is a round hole, which is suggestive. Um, armored catfish, I'll talk about it in a minute, are covered with this bony plated armor. So a normal spear probably would not be able to penetrate um, the the side of this fish but it's totally incredible and this is its uh, ventral um, you can see the ventral side here and it's got these amazing scooping teeth that are used to eat that wood and so you can actually hear them eating under the water and scraping in um, debris dams and it was just it's it such an absolutely amazing experience and um, so I was hoping to do my dissertation work on the ecological role of wood eating fishes in rivers. And it ended up not working out for a couple of reasons. And this again is more for students in the audience if you're thinking about doing um, tropical work or work out of the US. Um, but um, though we found a lot of them on this trip, based on records that we're hearing from both people locally um, in Peru and people who had sampled there in, in the past, like in the 1970s, 80s for the Shedd Aquarium and the Natural History Museum um, in Chicago and other museums throughout the country. Um, these, when you found these fishes, you found a lot of them, but when you didn't find them, it was um, you could go months or even longer without finding them. So that's not a great uh, trait of a of a, an organism, especially when you have to go so far um, into a place to find them. Um, the other um, major issue that we were experiencing, and uh, this is someone who attempted to work in Venezuela, attempted to work in the part of the Ecuadorian Amazon that's being developed for oil, um, and then here. Um, Politically, this was a very charged area. And this, this is covered from 2009, but a lot of the, the negative interactions that led to this interaction in 2009 started um, right about when we were there in 2006. And it didn't receive a lot of global media coverage, but there were strong um, negative interactions between the Peruvian government and especially the indigenous people living in the, the Marañón region. Um, and that was, um, it was evident that things were going to be very unstable there for a while. And so it wasn't the safest place for me to work from a political perspective. The other thing, and this, this article, I just wanna um, state this, this is from um, marine fishing, but what we also found was that local people were actually using dynamite to fish and the armored catfish, the wood eaters that I was interested in were often found in debris dams. And we did find, at least at one point, an unexploded piece of dynamite that was mildly terrifying and you couldn't actually see it under the water. And so safety concerns and the logistics of the life histories prevented me from working on the wood eating armored catfish. But I was still obsessed. And I, you know, I was a former Peace Corps volunteer and I was really interested in developing a project that, um, that would hopefully lend itself to some sort of policy or uh, development, uh, a positive outcome or learning about a problem. And this is where I flipped to thinking about armored catfish with reverential fear. So as I mentioned, armored catfish, because of their population or popularity in the aquarium trade, especially the genus Pterygoplicthes, has a huge global distribution because of um, places like Petco and others that are selling 
and distributing this fish throughout the globe. Um, interestingly, when we think about our, our invasive species, and this was true of me before I started thinking about it, I, I often read things about um, predators, so cats and snakeheads and other species that go into systems and just decimate local populations of organisms by consuming them or competing with them for, for other resources. I hadn't really thought about organisms that are eating food uh, resources that are in the base of um, an ecosystem, like armored catfish. So again, they're grazing. Um, and it's interesting to think about the, the extreme impacts that these organisms can have without actually physically, um, potentially physically interacting with, with other organisms just because of their consumption. We know that in aquatic systems, animals that graze um, can have profound impacts on really small scales. So these snails, um, I took this picture in my primary field site in Mexico, and you can see that their grazing activities are removing this detritus and um, exposing this underlying algae to light and resources. You can also see that they're pooping here and their little packets of poop are uh, resources that supply nutrients and other things um, to that algae. So if you're an algal cell living in a grazed area that's right next to a snail poop, um, you're probably gonna be a happy algae that, that has a lot of resources to grow and be productive. So we know, and that, again, this is a really small scale. Um, these, these snails are under a centimeter long. Um, and so you can think about this profound impact that if you added big grazers to a system, um, what might happen? And so um, I began exploring the range of invasive armored catfish and um, again, focused on the genus uh, Pteragoplichthys because they are, they're the sailfin catfish. They're sold as an essential component of um, your tropical uh, fish aquarium. Again, you can buy them in Petco, um, but when you buy them, uh, oh, again, I just want to highlight they're known as Pleco or armored catfish. Um, and they are um, medium to large fishes. And this is one of the big issues with them. So oftentimes when they're sold in Petco, they're, you know, a few centimeters long or a couple of inches, um, but they can grow up to be a meter long. So about three feet um, in total length. And that is huge. And it far exceeds what most people can put in their aquarium. And so they're oftentimes dumped um, into the environment where they've been thriving. Once they get there, they can breathe air. And so what this means is they can live in water with that's really high water quality with a lot of oxygen in it, down to water, like raw, basically raw sewage, and I have seen them in that, um, that has almost no oxygen in the uh, water because they can breathe the air. And they are covered with this bony armor. And this is interesting from multiple perspectives. If you, I will, I I will give my contact information at the end of this if you wanna talk about it. This is actually one of the reasons I'm obsessed with them. However, this bony armor also makes them really difficult to eat by native predators once they hit a certain size. Um, and they're detritivores, which means again, they're eating like dirt and other things at the base of, uh, in the benthic habitats or the bottom parts of streams. So they're usually not food limited. They're not gonna go to a place and eat themselves um, out of resources for quite a long time. And one of the places that I had noticed, and I actually found this site on YouTube, I found a video on YouTube. Um, this is the southernmost state of Mexico. This is the state of Chiapas. And I had found um, in the Asumacinta River, which is um, one of the largest undammed rivers in the Americas at this point. Um, and it runs, it uh, drains Guatemala, a little bit of Belize, and then a lot of southern Mexico. And it may, it forms the um, border between Guatemala and Mexico for a large portion of that. My primary study site was right around Palenque. So many of you um, may have been there if you've had the chance to explore uh, Mayan ruins. So this was one of the, the major um, Mayan settlements in the region. And so uh, the Chacamox River is a tributary of the Asumacinta and it runs through uh, Palenque National Park. In the Asumacinta, um, small scale and subsistence fishing is still really important. Uh, the two most, uh, the, the highest items in uh, demand would be snook, which they call robalo, and uh, pigua, which is macrobrachium, which are these large shrimp. Both of these um, species require um, undammed or passable rivers because their life uh, history requires them to migrate between freshwater um, and marine environments. And these are hugely important in local fisheries. 
Um, in 2005, just 2005, the first armored catfish was documented on the Osumacinta. And these are people who fish all the time, who know their river. Um, and so in the Chacamox uh, River Fishing Cooperative, they first caught um, an armored catfish. They actually, because it breathed air, because it's armored, they actually thought it was a crocodilian when they first saw it, not a fish, because it does not look or function like um, any of the native fishes, including gar. Um, there's a ver very diverse assemblage of native cichlids and introduced cichlids um, like tilapia um, and then the snook. But by 2007, just two years later, lorikrates made up more than 80% of the fish biomass harvested from the river. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the, the, the socioeconomic implications of that right now, but what I will say is that it was, it was a, it had a horrible effect on local economies um, and um, fishing community, entire fish communities basically collapsed any, any place that this invasion um, was documented. Um, my primary field site, as I mentioned, is in the Chacamox River. And just to give you a scope of the size, it's beautiful. This is what it looks like during the dry season. It's karst topology, so it's a uh, really light color in the stream bed. Um, and this is my partner um, who is helping me conduct a snorkeling survey at the time of the armored catfish in the river. And um, Thankfully, the Chacamox River is one of the favorite people that cichlid lovers love to go collect and they have collected here uh, famously since about the 1970s. And so I met some uh, German folks who were um, private cichlid collectors that had um, images of the benthic habitat in the Chacamox River prior to the Korea invasion. And so when you look at this picture, you can see that there's a lot of that detritus. Think about those snails grazing that away um, in the benthic habitat. and um, after, oh, and I just want to highlight, there are native grazers, again, snail species and some of the cichlids looking for macroinvertebrates or insects um, in the rocks will actually do kisses. So you can see this, and I've, I have a ruler up here for, for size. And these are snails um, and their grazing trails on the rocks. And so there were native grazers in here, but after Laura created invasion, it went to this. And so let's just go back quickly. And you can see this uh, fluffy kind of detritus and the, the stream bed is literally a different color. And then we get to after the Laura Creed invasion had occurred. And by the time I got to um, the Chacamox, um, the, the fish population was quite huge. And I have a video here. I'm actually going to wait and I'll share the video at the end so you can kind of see it. Um, but the density of armored catfish is very, it was alarming. And so this is the benthic habitat. You can see them um, in the Chacamox River and they would aggregate, as you can see here. Um, and so between 2008 and 2010, I was just doing snorkel surveys, trying to document populations. Um, so this is the biomass, the aerial biomass, so grams per meter squared of the fish. Um, and you can see through time, I was hitting the, the, the upward um, steady increase of biomass of fish in the river. And so it was almost 230 grams per meter squared of fish. And if you know anything about fish, you know that's a lot, but put, to put it in perspective for the rest of you, uh, the native fish biomass, which had probably been reduced because of fishing and other environmental issues had come down, but that is an orders of magnitude less. Um, so fishes that may, fish biomass may not have been a strong interacting component in this environment before are now hugely dominant in the system. Um, and again, you could go up to the, the invasion front, so you could see where the armored catfish had not gone up um, yet upstream and see this fluffy detritus again. In the intermediate areas where you didn't have these high densities of lorikreids, you could see these um, outlined scars of where they were grazing um, on the rocks. And then downstream where I was working, where the densities were just obscene, um, the benthic habitat was cleared every single night by grazing groups of fishes. And I did my dissertation work, uh, detailed experiments on this and making exclosures where fish could graze and not. This is after um, just um, three days being incubated and you can see if they were removed from the fish, you got this deposition of sediment and other things. And if they were not, and I apologize, I'm this is the stream reference, which was open, and then the cage control, which they could access, but we controlled for the point of the cage. It's completely cleared. And so I don't actually need to show you any data. Um, 
the photos say it all. But the, the important thing to think about is that these effects, even though they might not directly be consuming animals, and they probably are every once in a while, they're going to be having profound impacts on the food resources that are available for other species, like spenis, uh, this grazing water penny. It's a larval beetle, which is shown here, but they actively graze algae. And so their habitat has fundamentally changed, potentially exposing them to better resources, but potentially having these tiny little larvae competing for armored catfish for food. And then thinking about species like midges that make their home in this uh, detritus that has been completely vacuumed away and removed. And so thinking about these types of species and this type of diversity, so the expansion of invasive grazers um, may not be as jarring as seeing big predaceous animals eating and attacking other species, but it can have these massive potential effects on the um, habitat available and food resources available for other species. So the other thing, and I mentioned this, that I'm obsessed with bony armor. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in studying is how organisms actually modify how ecosystems work. And one of the most important things in the ways that ecosystems work is elemental cycling or biogeochemistry. And so animals, they, you, through excretion, ingestion, can actually impact the flow of nitrogen and phosphorus um, into the environment. And this can be really important, we know, because if you add nitrogen and phosphorus, like fertilizer, to uh, primary producers, you can see positive growth. So any animal that is modifying the exchange of nitrogen and phosphorus within the environment could have a potentially really big effect on um, this type of relationship. And again, we know that animals going poop and pee, we can use that as fertilizer. Here's a favorite example, cows uh, produce manure. Manure is used to fertilize things. It's not just cows. Lots of animal, well, everyone excretes and that waste can have important impacts. We know based on, um, you know, horrible images like this, if you change the availability of nitrogen and phosphorus in systems, you can lead to things like algal bloom. So we know that this from other systems, that this is a really important process. And so something that I noticed when I started going into the field was that Laura Cree has created these diel, so daily aggregations within the water. So this is again karst, and so it's really light colored benthos here. And so this entire group right here, what you're seeing is an aggregation of those armored catfish underwater. And I, again, I have a video of it, but just to show you what this is like during the day, they aggregate and create these giant groups of fishes. And at night, as soon as it's starting to get dark outside, you can see each individual fish spreading out to graze the entire benthic habitat. So again, each one of those dots is, is a fish. Uh, so this behavior, a bunch of fish potentially going to the bathroom during the day in these pulses and then moving out at night, is this creating hot spots of nitrogen and phosphorus coming out in the water? And this is to ask, mightn't they be having these other impacts? I wanna point out though, just to show you this, the aggregations are not flat, they're like stacked on top of one another. And so um, an aggregation like that has thousands and thousands of fish. Cause this is, I think this one was about um, between 15 and 20 meters long with layers and layers of fish um, in there. And so I conducted an experiment, oops, and you can't see it, but it was within the hotspot of this fish and outside up here. And so we had paired sampling and I just wanted to see if I could detect higher concentrations of ammonium, which is the form of nitrogen that animals excrete most of the time and phosphate. Um, in the water column. And in fact, we could. So in other words, we were detecting higher amounts of ammonium and phosphorus, which could potentially be stimulating gro uh, algal growth in the system in the river. And so they're eating, they're excreting, they could be having a lot of different impacts. But I wanna go back to this, and this is one of the reasons why I continue to be interested in working in this field site. Um, as I mentioned, armored catfish were 80% of the fish biomass harvested from the river. And this was important for three really important reasons. You can see here, there's almost no, there's a snook, a tail of a snook, and there might be a carp or a snook there. Again, carp, invasive species. But the great majority of fishes in this net are armored catfish. They are not saleable currently in Mexico. They are edible, but they're benthic feeding fishes in areas where they're using red labeled pesticides. So it's not very um, 
I don't think it's a very advisable idea to push eating them until we know what's going on with contaminants in those fishes. Um, they get stuck in the nets and they're covered with a spiny uh, bony armor that actually destroy nets. Most of the nets are handmade. They're exceptionally expensive. And because they get stuck in the nets, it takes way longer to clear them. So fisher people, most of them are men in this region, so we'll say fishermen, um, are spending way more time cleaning nets that are being destroyed by these fish for much less saleable biomass. And so it's had a profound impact um, on the local economy. And so you can see what I was calling Laura Creek graveyards on the side of a river. And this group of um, eight fishers who I, I was with this way dumped, we estimated more than a ton of armored catfish out on the bank just to clear out their nets to be able to fish for everything else. So this is having profound impacts on the fish community in these systems. I also want to highlight this is not from Mexico, this is actually from Florida, but there are weird interactions that you would not expect um, with armored catfish invasion. And this is one, they're grazing on manatees here. Uh, research has shown that they seem to be shifting manatee feeding and foraging behavior, and they're agitating the manatee skin because they're actually grazing the algae off of manatees. And so just think about lightly rubbing yourself with sandpaper all day and thinking about how that might end up feeling by the end of the day. Um, there's a lot of work with unexpected interactions with these grazing organisms and other species of potential conservation concern. Um, so to just kind of summarize some of the things we talked about today, uh, the talk was entitled Armored Catfish Are Awesome, and they are awesome because of this um, hidden and amazing biodiversity. I just wanna put it out there one more time. Wood eating fishes, people, it's amazing. Um, we also are concerned about the loss of these hotspots of diversity because of things like hydroelectric dam development that's going on in Peru. Um, but they also provide us a really interesting and important way to think about how personal decisions at, the lo at, a, at a household level can impact um, global distribution of native and invasive species and specifically, specifically thinking about uh, genera like Pterygoplicthes, Astyanax, or um, sorry, Ancestris, pardon me, Astyanax is not an armored catfish, um, and thinking about how that might um, influence the global distribution of species, but also, um, just thinking about these changes, losing wood eaters and adding these grazing species, species is not only changing how an ecosystem looks because of species, it's physically changing the habitat and also potentially um, how systems are working, like with biogeochemical cycling or environmental or elemental cycling. Um, and this can actually have really important socioeconomic uh, consequences in this case to very economically marginalized people living in Chiapas, which is one of the poorest states of Mexico. And armored catfish invasion, this type of invasion, this massive population boom and then uh, reduction in native fish biomass or difficulty in actually sustaining fisheries has happened in a lot of places uh, where armored catfish has invaded, especially in uh, Mesoamerica, so Central America and Southern Mexico. Um, and I just want to highlight that museum collections are exceptionally important in documenting this. I mentioned that the fish, the fish collection managers at a couple of institutions were the ones who supported that original um, trip to Peru using funds from at least some of the funds from the All Catfish Project to get a bunch of people down to the Marañón to look and document to science again. Um, these species was exceptionally important but also the collections that I've made and others have made documenting where they're finding armored catfish and, and making sure that they're in collections in Mexico is going to be important for um, future generations in documenting this, this type of environmental change. I also want to say that one of the reasons why I didn't continue to pursue that work in Peru was because of the extensive work of museum collectors um, and going out and documenting how often they actually found these assemblages of these wood-eating species. And I could have potentially wasted my entire time looking for species without ever finding them again, except for that wonderful trip. And that knowledge was um, given to me based on the experience of people who had been collaborating with um, and had the ability to go back in time and look at collections to see if they were seeing these wood eaters in those collections. 
So um, it's been a true pleasure to give you this talk and I'm excited to answer questions. Um, if you have any questions of, about Laura Creed's or Laura Creed uh, invasions or how animals going to the bathroom can modify ecosystem processes, um, you can reach me at kcaps at uga.edu and um, I would be happy to speak with you and we'll just end on the turtle pond again. Thanks so much and have a great day.